Welcome, everyone, to a Voices with Raveki. I'm very excited about this. Uh, this is a topic, we're going to be talking about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, Plato on beauty, something I've been talking a lot about. I've just taught, uh, taught a course on this called The Primacy of Beauty. And I'm here with somebody who's also teaching a course on this, so I'm looking forward to this conversation a lot. Uh, Thomas, could you please introduce yourself, introduce your course, uh, tell people how they could find it. We'll, of course, put links in the notes to this video, et cetera, but introduce yourself in the course and let's take it from there. Yes, sir. So I am I am Thomas Jockin. I am a designer from a design background. I teach at various art schools around the country. I've taught at Pratt Institute of Technology, Fasten, the Fashion Institute of Technology, uh, the SUNY system and the CUNY system in New York City. Um, my last teaching engagement was at the University of North Georgia. So I've taught in many different design topics, specifically in graphic design. That was my specialty focus. Uh, I also am a practicing typeface designer. So I work and produce fonts that are available on Google Fonts, Adobe, all those great platforms. Um, the topic we're talking about, what I'm presenting in the course on the Halkion Academy, is Plato on beauty and virtue. So the idea is an investigation of six dialogues from Plato investigating the topic of the beautiful and finding out through that investigation a very sophisticated and nuanced approach of how Plato is using the beautiful as an instrument to talk about his idea of the forms, his approach of understanding epistemology and love, and the use of images and realities. I think anyone in the arts, anyone that has any, any interest in these areas that generally, like when I went out to art school, I went to Parsons School of Design for my undergrad. Um, we had the Republic, but it's finally later in life when I found the greater Hippias, which is exactly on the topic of the beautiful. And I find, I think a lot of artists, if they may be off put by the Republic, especially with mm -hmm. that impression you get of the artist as the imitator, right? The poets that need to be banned and removed from the city. Um, we realize that Plato has a much more sophisticated understanding of images and reality in the artist and the beautiful and the greater Hippias is like a good starting point from there. But we also follow through with five other dialogues, following through the ontological, epistemological, and, and moral law virtue aspects of how Plato is using the beautiful to address all these points. It's almost as if to really understand Plato, we need to come to the beautiful, to come to really appreciate what Plato is trying to do in these dialogues. So you cut out there. I just wanted to make sure we got a, uh, what all the dialogues are you're doing. You're, you're doing the Greater Hippias. Are you also doing the Symposium and the Phaedrus? Yes. So the, the listing of the dialogues are Greater Hippias, Symposium, Phaedrus, Mino, Cretilus, and Parmenides. Um, so uh, the ordering of that is basically... Oh, oh, I see. Yes. Um, so the ordering is based on the idea of starting with first the greater hippies, which is an a explicit investigation of the beautiful using the sophist hippies as a foil to draw out the kind of a Lankis method of what we appear to be kind of concrete examples. First, concrete examples of beauty are being defeated and it moves on to higher, these different degrees of abstraction, which are all are defeated by the end. But then from there, we use symposiums discussion of love to draw out some aspects of the beautiful from that which is emphasized more in Phaedrus. And then from there, we're using Mino to investigate methods of understanding of, of, dialect, of dialectic process for beauty. And then finally, moving mm -hmm. into Cretilus with a discussion of names as images. It's very fascinating. Uh, and then finalizing using the discussion of the beautiful to come to address Parmenides, one of the most enigmatic dialogues. Uh, that in the discussion of the beautiful, we can come to an apprehension of what Plato is meaning by forms. Well, all of these topics uh, fascinate me. Uh, and um, it's something that I uh, do a lot of study and work on too. Um, so what, I mean, uh, you obviously can't teach the course here. <laughs> that would be uh, um, a, a ridiculous expectation. But, um, well, let's start this way. Beauty has kind of fallen on hard times in our, our culture. Yes. I mean, uh, Han in his book Saving Beauty talks about, you know, that uh, beauty used to be a name, you know, a name for the advent of the truth. It used to be Dionysus talks about it as one of the names of God. Uh, and Aquinas, of course, talks about it as one of the transcendentals that are most disclosing a being along with the true and the good. Um, and Han says, you know, beauty has sort of fallen off um, that pedestal for us. 
And he talks about how we've reduced beauty to um, the pleasant, the smooth. Um, what would you say, um, just to, as an initial starting point, we're gonna unpack this, but what would you say is the, uh, is the how, uh, this is your elevator pitch, right? And presumably you're gonna do this. How, what would you say to somebody who, and this is a very platonic notion of beauty, you wanna, you wanna shock somebody about you know, how different Plato's uh, vision of beauty is from ours. How would you start to try and sort of wake them up to the fact, because the problem with our culture is, I and mean, this is a platonic criticism, it presumes that it knows what beauty is in a very readily available manner, and, you know, in a consuming fashion. And, you know, one of Plato's, I, I would argue one of Plato's great points is, no, you actually don't, although beauty is very present to you, that doesn't mean you properly apprehend and appreciate it. Uh, so what would you say in your elevator pitch? It's like, you know, you probably think beauty is X, but Plato actually argues beauty is Y or something like that. I, I don't mean to put it in too much of a straitjacket for it, no, of course. but just to get us going, well, how would you start? Well, that's the whole point, right? Is that, you know, and it's actually echoing some met, some mentions from Bishop Robert Barron, which I know you've had conversations with, is that generally if they're three, three transcendentals, truth, goodness, and beauty. Yeah, yeah. In general, we found in our culture that our apparatus of discussion and communication with each other has, has decayed in all those other domains. But yet, ironically, the thing we take for most granted, beauty, we think we know it mm -hmm. and we encounter it all the time. But the point is when we actually, it, this is very much a platonic approach. And in fact, that's kind of the, it's almost like, so here's one of the points. Part is that the, 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 the first access of the, of the disciple to become, to become initiated into the discipline of, the, of dialectic and understanding the higher principles is actually from realizing that your impressions of the beautiful are, are misguided, that you, that you think you know is actually mistaken. Because when you are asked this demand, what is the beautiful in its all in its true es essence, not in its particular expressions, but in its true essence, just like, because there's a difference between the property of something being beautiful and the beautiful as standing for its own sake. That's a, a lot of people misunderstand that understanding. Because the problem is we think of properties mm -hmm. of things kind of, we think of, we, we kind of collapse that into pleasantness, right, of agreements. So there's, first of all, an issue of social agreement or social conventional norms. So there's discussions of that, like beautiful burials, for example, um, from Greater Hippias. So there's an issue of social agreement as the definition of what beauty is. That's challenged uh, in the initial, in Greater Hippias alone. Then there's issues of just basically personal agreement, right, in terms of personal preferencing of but the problem is that's basically the, I talk about this in my introduction essay. It's that's the equivalent of saying that something of a category of beauty is like an ice cream flavor preference. What's when, as you brought up before, this shocking element is the idea when we encounter the beautiful, it shapes our lives. It directly imposes something onto us that we, it all, and this is why the discussion of love happens here. Because when the, when we are lovers of a beloved, we are stricken by that love. And we want to become closer to our beloved, we want to be kind of a homecoming. So right there, this is not a, a preference where it has almost no, that's kind of the key thing is that generally we have a culture of indifference. So these kind of categories of directives of our good, of what's good mm -hmm. and what's true and what's beautiful has been, has been so collapsed into subjective preferences that are private, that have no influence really on others, let alone ourselves. Because also there's, as you hinted at, there's an idea of consumatory. The idea of the things that are consumed. It's almost a kind of a, uh, instead of anageia, it's kind of kinesis. It's kind of, to use Aristotle, kind of Aristotelian terms about this. That kind of uh, enactment that's consumatory versus an ever-present mm -hmm. uh, encounter with the thing. I always say that the example I always use with students is the idea of a sunset. When... And this is key, not just taking a photograph of the sunset with your iPhone, right? With your phone, uh, smartphone, but to actually be present with the sunset. You're not consuming it. It's a joy. It's a kind of presence with it. And the key is also very interesting is, is that usually these kind of present joy, contemplation, it's, a, it's something that could be partaken by many as one. So right there, as I'm talking through this, we're starting to parse through some of the key concepts of platonic thought. The many and the one, the idea of devote of belovedness and love and the movement of, of the soul to become reunited by recollection. Because in Phaedrus, there's very striking lines. It's through a mythology discussion that the human soul, by, by our, it was by our apprehension of the beautiful 
that our souls actually have what they are to be human, to be man, that have our ados or form. Um, so when we so, encounter, let, yes. yeah, let me stop here because I know you want to. <laughs> uh, I know you could go because you're, you're you're prepared to lecture, and, and I don't want to interrupt you too much. But like you're saying a lot, and there's a there's a there's a there's a there's one there's one spot there because, I mean, there's there's and I, and I think all of these are intended in what you're saying, and I think that's how I read them in Plato. But I, I want to unpack them, explicate them a little bit. There's many kinds of oneing, perhaps. There's a way in which our 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 psyche becomes one. There's a way in which we become one with whatever uh, we're beholding um, uh, through beauty. And then there's also a way that we are one with each other. And this was this was the thing that particularly, for example, uh, bothered Kant. And said if he talks about that in her book on beauty and the end of art, she said Kant was really bothered by the fact, I mean, intellectually bothered yeah. um, by the fact that unlike our preferences, right, we expect other people to agree with us about beauty. Um, in, in really, I mean, we, we make statements about blah, 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 but we do things like we point at things and say, oh, that's beautiful. And we ex expect other people to agree with us and feel that um, we are justified in pointing them to the beautiful, uh, you know, mountaintop or something like that. And this was this was so Kant, you know, he was very perplexed. I mean, he's locked into a Cartesian framework, but he's very perplexed by this fact uh, that they're they're. they're it's not social agreement in, you know, in the sophistic sense that we just sort of create a convention. It's that something seems to bind us together from outside of us. Yes. And we all, we all seem called together. So there's these three different senses of wanting. It, it, does that land for you? And do you, do you want to uh, pick up on that or, or do anything with that? Well, yes. I mean, that's obviously one of the parts that exactly like Kant has this kind of tension part. And also, especially, I mean, Kant is this idea of awe. Right. So generally kind of the drawing out beauty at one point had this awe quality built into it that in my reading of Kant, he starts pulling mm -hmm. away, which I think is a detriment. So you're actually misunderstood. You're not understanding what beauty really under is. It's, and by the way, it's kind yeah. of, the, you know, even the term for the study of beauty, right? We use aesthetic, right? Uh, you know, the term is cologne. That was the, that was what the, what Plato's referring yeah, to. Yeah. 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 I agree. The reduction of beauty to the aesthetic sense. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's part of the kind of apparatus, the kind of the motion, the movements that kind of draw out these kind of distinctions of our understanding, how our understanding of beauty is different from the past. Um, and that point, exactly. Like, by the way, the kind of, um, bindingness, this kind of compellent, uh, you know, there's a reason why I have a discussion about this in, in symposium, because obviously the whole Agathon speech about love, right? I think I, I, I'm always meditating on this line of, Never the victim of violence, never the actor of violence, the mover of men's souls softly uh, as flower, uh, kind of on their hearts. Uh, this kind of unforced force. It's always very interesting because idea that there, mm -hmm. what binds people, what, when we have a, a kind of zoom out for a second, if we don't, if we kind of use a more polit, a, a kind of social political context, what could we have coordination between people that is not coercive, violent force, right? Of the law. Mm -hmm. Right. Imposing onto people. The other the one way you can interpret this is idea when love moves people in this way, that kind of want that, that kind of does that kind of love of the beloved. That is a compelling movement, but it's not violence. And in fact, it's actually because it's not contrary to nature. No. Yeah. It is the actual fulfillment of one's nature to come into encounter. And I think of things like Aquinas, this discussion of natures of lo of love, right? The kind of a, the penetrative, the ecstatic and the liquefaction. Uh, qualities of love. There's all these nuances about the movement of desire, right? That this, and that's actually one of the most fundamental points is that, and that's the great question um, that the philosophical project needs to answer, which is if one is mistaken, if we have desires that can mistake in us because they're usually based on something false, there's some kind of falsity attached to it. Yeah. What are the movements of desire of love that move us to truth, to reality? To use the quoting from Diatima in Symposium, yeah. what is the science yeah. of the beautiful that does create images of beauty, but the actual realities that nourish true virtue and bring us into friendship with the gods? Well, well let me pick up on that connection because um, this is one that really interests me a lot and it overlaps with a lot of the cogs I do. Um, you know, that notion you just made, which I think is right in Plato, and then Frankfurt picks up on it. Um, when he talks about love as a voluntary necessity. And the thing about that is really interesting because he talks about um, 
because reason needs both. Reason needs a binding because if you don't have a binding, that this is the work I do. You just have unlimited amount of things you can pay attention to. Possible, like you get overwhelmed by uh, like uh, unconstrained cognition can't be rational. That's I, I I've got a lot of argument out about that. I won't repeat those arguments in place here. But if it's compelling, it's also not what reason is because reason is driven by this. Like you say, it, it has to have a freedom in it. It has to be an exploration. It has to be a like it, it has to be, as you said, somehow comported with our nature, growing our nature, maturing us. Reasoning is also a form of maturation in that sense. And so the thing about beauty is the fact that it has, like it, that it calls for love, right? Puts us into this voluntary necessity, which are like the two things we need to be re, to be rational, to be reasonable. We, we need, we need binding, but we need also, you know, something that is freeing us, that is growing us. Um, and, 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 you know, and Skari makes this point in her book on, on beauty about the deep connections between the experience of beautiful and, and, and being reasonable. So that point you made, and which I agree with you, it's just central in Plato about love having this power to move us without it being compulsive, even though it's deeply binding, this bindingness. And I talk about this as religio and relevance realization in Frankfurt, uh, calls it, um, uh, you know, a voluntary necessity. And, and that's the thing. Cognition needs to be bound if it's going to be rational. Unbound cognition uh, it cannot be rational. It has to be bound in some important way, but it also has to be free. It has to be free to explore and mature and grow. And there's something about being reasonable and rational that's a maturation process that's part of the, like you said, one with our nature. Um, and, and And so there's like... The fact that beauty can, like Scari says, can prepare us for being reasonable, for being rational, or, or Mur Murdoch's point about, um, you know, wh when, when we start to love something, we have to, f we, we finally face the reality of something being real other than ourselves. And this breaking out of egocentrism as so central to the project of rationality. And I'm saying all of this because of the point you just made about, you know, if we, it, Plato's proposal, maybe even a promise, if we could apprehend and appreciate beauty properly, beauty could actually guide us towards truth rather than being something like I, I want to, I'm trying to challenge, you know, the hermeneutics of suspicion that appearances and beauty are all, you know, cynical and deceptive and, you know, and are all designed to manipulate us and control us. It's like, no, 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 without beauty, right? Without beauty, without, without situations in which appearances lead us into truth, Right. We can't actually be rational. Sorry, that was a bit of a speech, but I was trying to get a, 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 I was trying to unpack that point because that point for me is a really vital one. That, John, that, I mean, that's excellent. That's exactly the point. I mean, this is the great tension. This is the ultimate question. And not and that's the thing It's not just in the arts. It's not just a question like the thing of this appearance to reality question. Is at the heart of the philosophical project of can we use appearances to come to true reality? And the suspicion, right? The, the, the philosophy of suspicion, of nihilism is to say, no, is the challenge to say, well, wait a minute. How do we know these appearances are reality? They could be something completely different. Um, they, you could be mistaken, right? And I do agree with you that Plato absolutely, and I know it from Mino, Mino, he says explicitly, it's like, no, we're not gonna fall down this nihilistic tumble dryer of how do we know we can come to the truth of things, even if we, we start from nothing. Because the key part is one is that from, from symposium, we see that love is intermediate, yeah. right? So it's not, bi it's not a state of, of contrary binary of ignorance and wisdom. Love is intermediate. So by being mm -hmm. intermediate means it's intermixed. We do have a connection to wisdom in that case. That's demonstrated from, from symposium. From Mino, it's demonstrated through that, that point out that Plato is making that having Socrates point out that he stands in that position. We can come to reality through a dial, through a process of investigation and through a, an investigation. Actually, and this is very key names. Now, it's really important because in Critilus, you, it gets demonstrated that names are actually a great mystery because they are images. They're not the thing they're purporting to be. And in fact, they're actually in a way, way their otherness compared to the thing represented is actually far more extreme than the typical example of a drawing. So the, 
A drawing is in least likeness like the figure of the person it's representing, right? So you can just you can justify the link of good likeness from that. But when a name, you know, there's an attempt in Anchorage Elis to try to use a basically phone, phonemes, right? The sound of things um, to justify their likeness to the thing. It fails in that dialogue because yeah. that shows Good that point. it means that the name and the thing are not connected in a split in any way that's very clear and it's showing that and it points out it actually is partly convention that allows this to work for dia noa noia basically to allow that to happen so it's very much like plato is saying you don't get to we are it's the, what you're pointing out is that yes it's through a true training and devotion to beauty that gives us the grounded the grounds to even pursue goodness and truth so i totally agree with that it's exactly on the point yeah i mean because you have the you have the point made in plato and then it gets picked up i think and really well developed by um by marlo ponti um uh you know the idea that um uh, illusion and real are comparative terms um and, and for me to say, well, that appearance is an illusion or deception, I do that only by comparing it to something else where the appearance is not an illusion or a deception because real is a comparative. I mean, and this is there's a part of the whole corpus. It's a driving theme through the whole platonic proposal, right? And, and it's so like you can only say these appearances are deceptive because you are pointing to the ones you take as more primary because they're beautiful in the sense that the appearances disclose reality. And that parasitic relation of the deceptive on the beautiful, I think, is also one of the profound things driving this argument that we've lost. It doesn't make any sense to say it's all deception. On the basis of what would you be making that claim? Right. And usually what happens is you get some crypto thing that slid in in a, in a power or justice or slid in in some undefended, unjustified way as the realities against which everything is being secretly measured without anybody taking up the explicit, you know, acknowledgement and defense of that. And so I think that that's the other part of this, the, the, you know, the platonic point, which is like, like I say, a driving thing through his whole epistemology and ontology is like, no, no, real is a comparative. It makes no sense. There has to be real. There has to be the beautiful because then we could not even, we would not be, the, the, the deceptive would lack, it would be a completely lacking in intelligibility. It would be a cognitive void for us. And Kritila says the whole point that like, there's a very explicit exchange made to have me affirmed that acting and acting upon are part of reality. That's what I, I talk about that. That, that is actually, actually, ironically, any, anyone is, that's empiricist in position has to concede that point that yeah. if acting and acting upon are real, that those are real things. Uh, that's what, that's basically our saving is that, that argument. Is that is that that claim that the poion and past done right? The kind of acting and acting upon are true or part of true reality. Uh, it gets very fascinating. The question of are, are those are usually there's a presumption then there's some there's some object that is doing the acting right and the thing being acted upon mm -hmm. right. There's a relationship that happens there too. Uh, but that's definitely like the foundational core parts that's being built up there. I agree with that. Thank you for watching. This YouTube and podcast series is by the Verveke Foundation, which in addition to supporting my work, also offers courses, practices, workshops, and other projects dedicated to responding to the meaning crisis. If you would like to support this work, please consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. So, I mean, I think we're converging around, you know, uh, um, the deep rationality of beauty, but here's something that comes up that I could I could see sort of, and you know I have the romantics dancing in my head right now, uh, but I think there's a platonic response too, and you know Drew Highland drew this out in uh, his great book Plato and the Question of Beauty, which is because when people hear rational, they hear propositional and inferential, they hear an argument, and part of your point and part of a point of a lot of third way platonic scholarship. No, a lot of this rationality that we're talking about here is not ca carried by propositions or inferences. It's carried non-propositionally in very profound ways. And we, and we, we ultimately move from dianoia to no noesis, for example. And we even move from noesis to, you know, participation. Um, and these are, we're moving out of propositional representation. We're moving into something else. So I know this is an important part of, uh, 
what you're talking about. Do you do you want to pick up on that and riff on that a little bit? What I just said does that land for you first of all? Because what I'm trying to do is also say, look, yes. you've made this argument about, of course, you know, the rationality of beauty, but it's not rational in the inferential argument uh, to sense. It it, it it doesn't exclude that, but it goes be much beyond that. Yes. Well, there's two parts. I mean, one, I mean, first of all, that's an indictment on truth, too, by the way. Yes. Yes. Because if truth is based, if you use the correspondence theory of truth, you've actually now actually just, you know, what you just did. You just said truth is a bunch of judgments of sentence of propositional statements. Right. Yes. Uh, so that's it's the correlate. You've created now an argument of images to reality. You've done that. See, that's kind of one of my driving points is to see what you think is actually just an issue about beauty. If you don't understand this properly, you've actually now incriminated, you put on trial truth, because if you use the traditional correspondence theory of truth, right, that through figures of arrangement of propositions, you can come to reality, even though, even though it's acknowledged that that's only validity, yeah. it's not soundness, yeah. it's that tension point. So I could just draw, I could push on that issue uh, versus aletheia, right, the kind of yeah, yeah. discussion Eric Heidegger talks about, the aletheia, the opening, right? Uh, that's a completely different understand. Like that's what I mean by the distinction of proposition of properties versus the actual essence of these transcendentals. There's a difference. So in truth, that's the difference of the two. The property of truth, which Aristotle states, is in the is in the judgment of propositional arrangements. Right. So that's an image, basically. That's an image, and it has to connect to the reality it connects to. It only has validity otherwise. It does not have soundness. Just like that. Uh, that's the so that's when we're drawing out that in the relationships of things kind of circle back on that beauty with these let's see if let's put this because that cause it got me draw out with this truth oh yes because the whole idea of that because what i'm bringing up here is that notions of empathy intellect having apprehension judgment and reasoning right so a lot of people think it's our interaction of the judgment and the apprehend and the judgment and the reasoning that's where rationality is but actually from quoted from aristotle this is that his explicit definition of rational actions is to do and act for use as medicine right to heal or not heal it's the choice is having the power to choose to heal or not heal towards a choice of good that one's that an actor is acting towards versus a rock right a rock is not rational because it can only go down it doesn't have any power of choice. Uh, so already right there, even within the, I'm using Aristotle to make that point. The, our understanding of what it means to be rational is much more nuanced just from that Aristotle. But to build on that part, yet the idea of apprehension, that part of reasoning is actually shaping one's soul. And it's actually directly from Phaedrus, right? Is that which the, I know myself by what I desire. My soul is directed by mm -hmm. whom I devote myself to and shape my soul to apprehend and to engage with. This is very fascinating again, in a mythology model, but the hierarchy of the gods. And I bring up this up to circle back to our original point about when we read Republic, if you read this an argument of the image makers being basically imitators and being banned from the city state, the city state, those are represented in the hierarchy, right? They're imitative artists. But the artists are also represented with the with the philosophers at the highest level. Yeah. What's up with this? So there's this com the kind of when we're talking about this beauty is also a, a demonstration of what one loves is usually a, is argued as a sign of who you are. And this is part of what it means to be rational is, as you say, maturity. It's a kind of development of oneself yeah. through and then they use the diatema ladder of love argument from individual bodies to the abstraction of all body. Right. And then from thought to actions and then the thought to laws to structures, all that. These are all engagements of the soul that is actually the marker of oneself i think that's a very nuanced point is that because generally we think a lot of times like we've we're, we've kind of um how about put this offloaded the pursuit of truth to be abstracted away from us that it's not individual subjects that actually need to have our souls that need to be cultivated to access truth it needs to be removed out to instruments or to peer review so that these externalities are the things that have wisdom that we don't that I think that's actually a very new one. I'm just riffing on this point now, but no, this is riffing on this. I, that what's Plato's getting at that part of the rational is the cultivation of one's soul through language of devotion, right? Of love of this cultivation of oneself. I want to reply to that because that, that, that was excellent. Um, and uh, this might be helpful to people that are listening. Um, 
I, I, I point out that we have a notion uh, of the reasonable person that's in law that doesn't allow us to abstract ourselves from the situation. What would the reasonable person do? And it's not so much about them being able to marshal arguments. About It's about them appropriately apprehending the situation, taking up their appropriate role, assuming the right identity, and having the right character to bring the right skills and virtues to bear on the situation appropriately. I mean, and so, and like, so for example, even like, you can be found criminally negligent, even though you didn't do anything, because as a reasonable person, you should have done X. And so we carry this ancient notion uh, different from that, right? So Descartes takes logos, which is this much more comprehensive notion, and reduces it to logic, like what you just talked about. But if you go back, right, right, and, and I, I, here's why I can quote Aristotle, you, you know, back to you. You know, the law is about reason about, 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 above passion, right? But it's the reasonableness that we're talking about here. Like it's about, it's about marshalling rational arguments depends on cultivating one's character as a mature, reasonable person. I think that's part of the point that you and I are sharing here. And that what Plato is saying is that part of that proper education so we can be reasonable Right. Because, you know, even in, and think about in the symposium to apprehend the beauty of the laws. Right. Is right. Is that beauty can be part of the, is a proper part of that educational process and our relationship to it is a proper way in which we can mature. You brought this up before in one of your in one of your lectures and in, in after Socrates, um, where. In Phaedrus, there's a line about basically where it gets translated as temperance. And it's completely not the normal. It's the idea of the acquired opinion to desire the best. Yes. That is exactly. So the moral virtues, right? The cultivate yeah. one, to have, to be cultivate the self, to actually desire the best. So that's, see, that's the key. The answer is to kind of circle back to a point I brought in the beginning a little bit, where how can I know my desires are aiming towards reality that I'm not mistaken? It's by cultivating the moral virtues to have desire for the best. It kind of is a theological argument. If one loves God, everything else kind of falls into place. I think it's Augustine who says that, uh, remember correctly. Um, that desiring of the best as temperance, it's such a fascinating interpretation uh, compared to the kind of, you know, kind of more the kind of resistance, the kind of cutting back, the shutting yeah. down of desire. No, it's yeah. actually the opposite. You should, be have, you should have this driving passion to come to the to the best, to the to virtue, to the to, to the excellence of one of of all existence. That's beautifully said. And so, I mean, part of I mean, part of the the answer to that question, and it goes with this, is the anagoge, the reciprocal opening. And love is a kind of reciprocal opening. Um, you know, you become beautiful within, and so you see more deeply beautiful without, so, right? And you get that resonance back and forth. But what that gives you, I, I think this is part of the platonic argument, is you get this sort of cascade effect. If you if you properly proportion your desire, like your theological argument to God, then you make all the comparative judgments correctly, and it cascades back down to you doing even the most mundane things, because you are making like because of all judgments of realness are proportional judgments comparative judgments, if you get it right, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't just show up in sort of lofty contemplation. It shows up in the, in the, the minutia of your everyday life because you, you're saying, well, I, I must be oriented towards the truth because this is cascading through all the levels at which I'm implicitly or explicitly making judgments of realness, and they're all tracking. I keep, I keep solving my problems. I keep becoming a better person, et cetera, et cetera. What do you... Like, uh, I, I think there's a deep answer here, which is like, uh, the, the, again, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, what I'm picking up on what I think is an implication of what you're saying. Because when we, when we start talking this way about cultivating virtue, and this can sound very lofty and like, you know, you have to go to a cave or a monastery or that this doesn't track down into your everyday life. Um, and I'm not saying that there can't be mystical experiences. I, I, I would never say that. But what I'm saying is this is not just mystical. It, it, it's a mystical that cascades back. It proportions all of your apprehension. So it's right in the guts of your existential life. It's in the decisions you make when you're even choosing the word to say to somebody when you're in the midst of a conversation. 
Like I'm trying, like I'm trying to say, I'm hoping. That- Doesn't Aristotle, Aristotle, one of Aristotle's words uses that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. It's about no, uh, you know, the, the anger. It's not about being angry or not. It's about, you know, being angry at the right time for the, for the right reason, to the right degree, to the right person. It's all that proportioning. And so the answer is, well, you know, I find that, uh, sorry, this sounds pretentious. I feel, I feel like beauty is presencing here in that I feel the hand of beauty, I'm sorry, speaking poetic here, helping guide me to the proper proportioning of the words that I'm saying to you so that I get that sense of connectedness, reciprocal opening between you and me. And it's happening right here. I, I, I'm trying to get people to understand that we're, although we're talking about something very lofty, we're also talking about something very present. I don't want to get into a two worlds mythology here. Yes, 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 yes. I'm not to jump in. I don't want to jump in, but this is a huge point. The reason why Plato makes very clear in Phaedrus the idea that our striking of beauty is from this world is the direct access we have. It's not to the base, not the, not the other world, but that's my point is that it's the one we allows that we have direct access to the most immediate, yeah. the most clear. And it's actually a mercy that we get that. Plato makes it clear that, you know, if justice or wisdom was to be visioned in the forms of those became clear to us, we'd be destroyed by it. We'd be put in terror. But, uh, beauty is the one that we have strike that can strike us at the most material. So that's the key. So it's actually ironic because like usually the argument is made that Aristotle is the great savior of the material reality in the sense of heliomorphs. Right, that old material existence is form matter yeah. composites, and Plato is the, the Gnostic argument. Of, and by the way, there are some dialogues that do present that argument, especially of human souls being trapped in a prison. Right, Phaedra, Phaedra, uh, Phaedo has that example. To be fair, however, that's not that's not the totality of Plato's account because uh, what we're bringing up is that material reality has imbued in it beauty, and by that fact. Material reality has direct connection and communion and participation, right, with yeah. the forms. It is not a other world, complete divorce, right? So that's one of the draw arguments that Plato is using. I also can use arguments like from the idea of, of virtue with actuality with Enigea, right? That basically the more virtue is idea of engagement activity of act of Enigea and things act in, in hierarchy relationship to that in degrees. So that's, that's another way you can build arguments, this, the breakthrough, the other world splitting, the, the great chasm of material reality and higher realities. Um, but yes, those are, I think that's a very, like for Plato, this is why it has such great power, both on two parts. Part one is what you're bringing up to kind of circle back on the moral law, kind of social relationship ethics side. How does beauty play with ethics? I mean, it's a very interesting argument versus when you say, was this the right act versus the, this was a, did you act with beauty in this act? So for example, right? So you mean that comment, John, about how you're speaking with me, but even things like getting in, getting in a, in a fender bender, are you acting in an overly excessive, overly ugly way with, a, with the other counterparty, for example, or how you're like, it almost gives you a measure. It gives you a reference point of basically how one comparts oneself in life, right? In, in, you, in actions of anger or in courage or in temperance management of, of apprehension desire, right? These are things that the beautiful kind of draws that kind of connects us to the material reality and does not, is not the intellectual virtue that's completely hypothetical and contemplative. It also penetrates into the deep material existence of our everyday lives, just on that part. Also, the very fact that because his argument, and you know, is right on there, that right opinion is emphasized as such an important element of the generation of the laws. Basically, because the question become there is, can virtue be taught? It's it's brought up that in the way it's presented, uh, no, because what it, what was being drawn out there was, in my opinion, using an Aristotelian reading of that, was it wasn't making a distinction between the moral virtues and intellectual virtues. So like learning techniques, like wrestling, for example. Um, yeah, those could be taught. Those excellences can be taught very, you know, those can be, can be taught relatively well. The moral virtues are a different discipline training. Um, but with that said, in that dialogue, there's a discussion of where do the right law, when the, when these, when these heroic men, right, basically when the laws get made, they're made with right opinion. And it's very fascinating. He said in his art presentation that you can get to the right destination with right opinion. Just as much with knowledge, 
there's a distinction of the two. But what you're, I'm bringing up this point because your whole idea is that when one has a compartment oneself to beauty, even if you don't have the full understanding by you having the proportional relationships of things, you could be guided by right opinion to come to true reality. So I, that's the kind of me painting through what Plato is saying in that section. Um, but I do think that's corresponding yeah. to what you're saying, what you're, I heard from you on that side. And then the other side, and, and in terms of the relation, how one relates oneself with other people and ourselves. Yeah. The kind of almost like the, again, this is drawing out not only our epistemology in terms of how do we know things, how do we act with one another, right? What is our relationship to each other and also the laws and how we organize society and our communities. These one would think that beauty has no standing in any of these cases, but they actually do. And that's what Plato seems to be in my reading. And what we talk about in this course, which is happening on July 27th, um, we're going to talk about how beauty applies to all these dimensions, which one would think if you come from a contemporary modern point of view, would almost seem like ridiculous. They would not be realistic to, to talk about beauty in these different domains. That's great. I, I, so there's a couple points uh, I, I want to pick up on, but let me do the first one first. And this, this is based again on uh, David D.C. Schindler's The Primacy of Beauty. And we're very much talking about the primacy of beauty here, right? Um, um, you know, it, you have to, it, it, it's the start in, in an important way. And he talks about the centrality of goodness because it leads you into a normative orientation. And then that is what you need in order to get to the ultimacy of truth, the, 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 the participation in ultimate reality. And that's what he means by primacy of beauty, centrality of goodness, ultimacy of truth. But the point that I heard you saying that points to what he's saying is, you know, the transcendentals, this is the old doctrine, the ancient, or even, or at least the scholastic doctrine um, about the convertible of the, the, they're convertible to each other. There's a deep interconnectedness between the true, the good and the beautiful. Um, they're not identical, but you, they are interpenetrating and interdefining in important ways. Like, for example, if you don't think that truth is a good, then you are very problematic. You have a very problematic understanding of truth or something like that. And there's all these arguments, uh, uh about, uh, th them being connected like this. And, you know, Habermas really wrestled with, you know, the, the Kantian critiques basically make these three autonomous from each other, uh, Right. Uh, we have knowledge and 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 then ethics and then we have aesthetics over here and that the three are autonomous uh, from each other um, in. Uh, and then he realized and then his, his whole critique is, that, well, that's a disaster. And that's the big mistake of the Enlightenment that he's he was working to try and correct. And it seems like what you're just talk, you, what you were just recently pointing on is that. If when you start to get into beauty, and I think this is also part of what Plato's argument. And, and we seem to be making it too, is you find yourself inexorably bound up with the true and the good as well as the beautiful. It doesn't seem that, right? And, and, and the point is you can start with any one of the three um, and, and you end up in the other two. There's a strong sort of positive manifold between them. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think that uh, this is also part of what because, because then the idea is that, that there's a there's a one behind there's a oneing of the three transcendentals that is also a goodness that is not just the goodness of the true or the good or the beautiful the ethical good right there's, there's a one a, the, you know the one beyond being uh, uh, and the and the and the interpenetration of the true the good and the beautiful which we seem to be bumping into points to that do you do you, to get into that, it, it sounds like you do because uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is you talk about the Parmenides. So this t seems to me to be an inevitable way in which um, your your course might have might be going. But maybe I'm being presumptuous. I it's I'll say this: there's a great question about the nature of the relationships of the good, the true, and the beautiful. I say that because Greater Hippias, I think part of the reason why it was for a very long time not considered, it was very curious about its authenticity as a platonic dialogue, was because it has a very explicit line where it's pushed and challenged that beauty has a supremacy over the good. Yeah, yeah. Right? That it's that yeah. the good is the, the is the son of the father. Yeah. Right. So there's a huge tension. I mean, I find that fascinating because again, the classical traditional view has been transcendental, the convertibility. You're correct right. uh, about the good, the true, and the beautiful. But that dialogue is presenting, at least it, 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 it complicates the presentation uh, right there, uh, just on that presentation. 
Um, and we see that a little bit in, in Philippus as well. In Philippus, uh, there's a discussion, there's a little bit of that as well. So that's a later platonic dialogue having some least complications about the convertibility question. I think they definitely are interrelated. They have a definitely um, interpenetrative. I absolutely agree with that. I think that's totally true. And as we're discussing is that it's through that a real whole, a true authentic investigation of any of these three topics will get you to the other two. They will eventually get you there. Uh, I do agree with that. Um, but in terms of reading the Platonic dialogues and what is Plato's take from yep. his point of view, from what he wrote in these dialogues, I'm not, it's difficult. I'm not going to tell you. I don't think it's, it's, it's not the clean cut example. You, if you just read a cursory survey course, you would come to a conclusion immediately of inter, inter convertibility. Um, Aquinas present that case. Like, you know, the scholastics come to that conclusion. Um, but that in terms of Plato's dialogues, what he presents, I think that's, it's definitely, an, it's one of our major areas of question. So like beyond, once you accept that the beautiful is something of investigation worth it. Yes. No, I, I, I picked that. I, I think that's right. I think, um, and I don't want to, I, I really agree with that. And I don't want to, I don't want to leave uh, up that. I, I fear I might've misrepresented David because he's using superlatives for each one. Uh, the primacy, the centrality and the goodness. Cause uh, the, 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 sorry, the, the primacy, the centrality and the ultimacy, because he wants to say that each one is superlative, like, in, like, in, uh, in this way you're pointing out, uh, there, there's kind of a non dual they're not identical. Um, and you can't just sort of stack them. They have, I, I think of them as like, almost like a, a dynamic holographic relationship. That's why I use this, uh, interpenetrating. Um, they, they've got sort of a non duality about them. Uh, they're, they're not simply, the one of a homogenous one, and yet you can't pull them apart, and 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 even attempt to get them into a static hierarchy seems to undermine itself because there's a dynamic there's a dynamic in their intelligibility that can't be captured by a simple hierarchy. You get the the intelligibility of these is this non dual dynamic thing in which you you like you you can't. You can't homogenize them. You can't sort of logically identify them with each other. You can't just render them in a static hierarchy. They're, they're, they have this dynamic fluid. Um, so like I say, I, I almost think of it like a dynamic holograph in which things are constantly zooming in and zooming out of each other. And for me, that's great because, um, you know, I'm a Neoplatonist and that's very much the Neoplatonic understanding of how we should, uh, uh, take these things up. Um, and, and so um, I totally agree with the point you made. I, I think I, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with the Neoplatonists that this was Plato's intent. It's quite likely it's just a fortuitous problem that Plato was wrestling with. But pr leaving that tension in place was actually so fruitful. I think it was it was a fortuitous, uh, you know, presence of a problem because it I think actually points us. Uh, to a deeper understanding of the relationship between the transcendentals and ultimately to the one. Yes. You know, I, I'm reminded in, in Critilus, there's a line about basically what is the, because there's, if you read the English, there's the idea of the, the good, the, it's actually translated as the good name, right? So what is the good name, right? For relationships of objects to things, the thing to the name, it's actually the cologne. So the word, the Greek is cologne. So it's actually what is the, it's the fine name, the fitting name. It's the name that core, that connects truly and goodly the, the app, the thing that it's reading addressed to it. Uh, so that's an example where that's a, when we talk about that in a dialogue, a kind of interplay that notice this is not just that the use of the associate, the placement of the, of the fitting name, the fine name is a connection with what is good and true. To connect with reality, uh, and and it's good because it connect it yeah, gives us an yeah. instrument to connect with reality. So it gives us utility benefit quality, and it connects with it is actually true in the sense that it connects with it. Uh, we have a relationship with it. Um, to use a correspondence or framing in that way. Um, so I just draw out this point. I agree with the, I So like the thing is, I I think it's very important when we read Platonic dialogue to come back to them. This is actually why I think Johannes brought me in. And I agree with, with the Halcyon Academy's general philosophy to return back to Plato because there is such wealth of understanding possible. A rereading is very much possible that from a, when we think of a serious, careful investigation of these dialogues to see a much more sophisticated, sophisticated and full of creative tension. Good works of art have tension. They have this kind of, uh, I think of um, from yeah. active inference, right? Yeah. This kind of um, 
polysemy kind of surprise quality where it can generate through tension kind of new understandings and new readings. A good work of art has that, that, you know, a work of art is dead if you could just read it once and get the reading. If you could just get a quick, a, a cliff note of it and get the full understanding of it and all it's reading, it's dead. It's not a work of art. That's just something else completely different, something else differently. Well, well, but, that, but, but that's exactly, I mean, that's to the point we've been talking about, you know, uh, you, when you get, I mean, beauty is this, you know, the, the emergence of new intelligibility. Um, it's both a surprise, but it's not a horror, right? It's right on the edge. It's on the horizon. And, 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 you know, and that, and I think that's one of the criteria uh, of something being sacred when we, we find it to be an inexhaustible fount of intelligibility. That's how I find Plato's works because of what you just said. But for me, that's like, yeah, but that's an exemplification of reality. You know, this is Polanyi's argument. The way we find the real is we find those, we find that which is an inexhaustible fount of intelligibility that keeps surprising us, but keeps surprising us in a way that we, that we go, Oh, now I see. Now I get it. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Um, so I, I totally agree. But that brings me to the other question I wanted to ask because, you know, this is a work of art and now we've like really elevated it when we talk about it that way. It, it has the capacity to be sacred for us. And this takes us to another point, which you've been sort of, uh, alluding to throughout our discussion, which is, you know, sort of post the romantics and then, uh, and then post the post romantics, you know, where we, we replace beauty with the aesthetic sense and we get Collingwood. And what makes a work of art a work of art is its uniqueness and your, it's, you, you expressed your subjectivity and your uniqueness. And then you get this combative, you know, subjectivity where I'm just trying to shock people with my uniqueness and my difference from all the other artists. And you get what we sort of have now. Um, and, we, we, and, and for many people, art has become, um, either entertainment or something that is disposable because it is just this sort of self-indulgent, almost narcissistic enterprise. And I take it that one of the things you're saying is, no, there's a different notion of art if we reconnect it to beauty in this fashion and of the artist. Because as you mentioned, the, the the philosopher kings can be artists too, right? Um, so what what what's the implication for the status and role of the artist if we were to adopt the platonic understanding of beauty and its relationship to art? And I know you want to say, and you should, Plato's relationship to art is very also tensive because there's condemnation of it as mere imitation, but there's, he uses it himself. Like in the very dialogue, yeah. the Republic in which he condemns poetry and art, he does some of the most amazing poetry and art in all of literature. Like it's just, yeah. Anyways, I'm saying too much. Make space for you. Yes. Thomas. Go I'll talk what you first said, John, which is the whole point. Yeah. That the issue of depictions, portrayals to reality, Plato uses it extensively. Right. So allegory of the cave in Credo, the personification of law to speak to him. Right. Like it's, it's the mythology stories in many of the dialogues. So like yeah. they, in, in Phaedrus, the chariot, for example, these Plato is very aware of the, in, the use of images to connect with reality and the, or the Republic. You use the city and, to yeah. under, you use the city yeah. to understand the psyche, right? Exactly. Go, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 exactly. But that's my point. So first of that, so again, this is why I love Plato's dialogues because again, it's like you have to have a meta awareness as you're reading this that sometimes when he's speaking with you and presenting one case, yeah. it's actually in, in, it's either in some degrees, very like, just like soaking in irony. In other cases, the irony is sitting in the background. Kind of, it just adds a lot more flavor to the whole experience of reading these texts. Um, you know, that's why I find it's important to read these in, in the circulation. I always think I would consider reading Platonic dialogues in a certain kind of spiraling circle kind of operation because of exactly yep. those net yep. those net requirements of memory to kind of recall mm -hmm. what you read from other dialogues and seeing the relationships between them. It's very beautiful. Okay, but. There's that part. Now, what you just brought up before about the kind of the, the genealogy of modern art, I always point to the kind of quick reference point to kind of draw a demarcation line is Duchamp's Fountain. I know you said fount of understanding of what art, kind of drawing out understanding, so I'm just going to riff on that, with Duchamp's Fountain. Fountain, Because what that did at that exact moment was to draw out basically a privational stance of art, that it is in the act 
of and privation, challenging, destroying, negating the, the cultural social norms of the academy, of the art discipline as a cognitive object. That is what modern arts project became from that point on. That's my, that's one, that's an argument I would make. Uh, because the value of that piece, it's, an, it's intelligibility, not as a fountain with a piece of signature on it, is only comprehensible to someone trained in the arts who knows what was the strike of intention of this work. To, and it's, done, it's in a mode of privation. It's in a mode of privation on the sense of like stri striking away at being, right? Uh, versus revealing being. So it's almost like you can see a complete dial, complete inversion of the approach. And that, and that same thing goes with generally a kind of self-expressional private experience presentation that this is just a, this is the act, the act of the artist is to use in privational striking against social norms, the uniqueness of a soul of an individual self that, and that an expression of that is what art is. That's the modern art interpretation or its stance. If I had to summarize the point, um, the, that's, but that is not exhaustive. It's because we've had it for 150 years does not mean it's the totality of what art is supposed to be. And first of all, by the way, I want to point out like the reason notice that, um, it's almost like basically ethics being convert can being collapsed to trolley problems. It's like converting art to basically beauty being art, right? I kind of do it's useful because it draws out distinctions and draws as it's little toy examples, but to collapse the entire category into that one subject is a mistake in my opinion but with that said the kind of artist and as yes. we just demonstrated plato is an artist because he's using these instruments of resemblances portrayals exemplars to draw out intelligibility like that's kind of the draw and that's kind of why the kind of uh we, i brought up before like kind of the, the kind of divorcing of awe from beauty was kind of took us away from understanding Right, because when we talk about surprise, information, and kind of information theory, it's this drawing out of contrast of intel intelligence, intelligibility comes from contrast. So, what beauty can give you as an artist is to draw out through forms that are familiar something revolutionary, new. So that's the unique. So that's the thing. It's like kind of like this instinct of like newness of uniqueness that was brought in modern art to be about the subjective self, the individual artist drawing out unions by their own subjectivity being struck, striking out against the cultural norm of the art world or academy. There's another mode of that, which is the kind of uniqueness that comes from particular expression, right? Of intelligibility through something. And then I use this, I, I draw about this in Parmenides, the gigunomai, right? The kind of uh, newness coming into being that is new. That is not pre-known. It's almost a kind of relevance realization in the sense that it was not known before and revealed itself out to it from a, from a mm -hmm. kind of material that was already existent. Something new came out of it that was, and it's always, and it's always tricky about this. It's almost like kind of, kind of, dis, like a kind of, kind of dissonance about it because it's like once you get a strike of that image, that kind of newness, that coming into being, you were like, oh, that was always there. It's kind of, but it, from a platonic point of view, it's because you have recollection. Cause you recall, cause it was always there. You just weren't aware of it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, fun, yeah. but you know, so that's kind of, that's kind of, the, that's always, that's kind of a fun trick human minds do is that kind of black swan events or things that were surprises. We always retroactively think we're always known, but they were not, but that's kind of what an artist is supposed to, it's purpose of the artist is to kind of be that courageous soul who kind of engages with, with kind of draws out from the material, what is known something strikingly new and intelligibility that when it has that mark of beauty, has that kind of, and I kind of, I reference this point, I got the strike of a sunset, right? So when a sunset is unique in this sunset, beauty, so a sunset is not beautiful, but an abstraction. Actually, it's one of the big things I teach, teach my students. A lot of students, when they first come into the art training, they work in concepts. We're kind of sitting in these va vapors of co abstractional concepts. So for example, if I ask you to look at color theory, you know, they'll look at red and say, oh, it's red. But then I'm realizing there's a kind of yellow red, there's a purple red, there's a bluish red, right? There's different saturations of that red. There's a dark, you know, there are nuances of perception that just the abstract concept of red will never give you. The uniqueness of this individual red needs to be expressed. And the training of the artist is to help see true reality through that apprehension. 
and generate, and that's what, so I'm kind of draw, I'm kind of, as you see here, I'm using a natural phenomenon perception. When we, they generally come into the class experience learning color theory. At first, they'll, I'll show patches of red and they'll just say red, but, and not, and not realize that, and see the strike, an artist has deeper connection to reality by seeing that there's different hues of red. There's a yellowish red. There's a bluish red. Yes. There's a greenish red. There's different degrees of saturation. These, an artist cannot draw out from just abstractions the general kind of red they can they need to be able to strike to the particular unique expression right in front of their eyes just like a sunset is not by abstraction beautiful it's this sunset that's, that's beautiful there's a kind of particularity that the artist has to engage with so that's yeah. so that's what i'm saying so like that's why the modern art is an inversion of these principles it's a complete inversion um because it took what with what was actually connected to true reality and intelligibility Right, has been stricken and inverted by privation, by modes of lack, basically, of striking yeah. away things. Yeah, 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 exactly. We we made reality this blank canvas, and in order, and all the richness is then sucked into our subjectivity, rather than saying no, no, no. Like the reality, like you just said, like you know, you don't you don't act, you can't rock red. You think you do because you have this word, and you might do a sort of prototypical color patch in your memory, but you have seen many, many more reds and somehow like, what's the through line of all of those? And like, as soon as you start reflecting on your experience in any uh, intelligent manner, you start to see exactly what you're talking about. And, and uh, Scari talks about this when she talks about, uh, you know, she says, you see the beautiful tree and you get that. I didn't realize trees could be like that. But then you said there's something of memory about that. And for me, that's like, because memory is reconstructive. When we get, when we get a new realization, we sort of reconstruct our previous, we go back and we reinterpret all the trees that we've seen because trees can be like this. And so you get this flow back and forth between everything you've seen and this newness. And there's, and that's also that, that's part of the flow of beauty. The fluency of beauty is exactly that re, Re, re remembering, like reconstituting, reconstructing your memory so that it is better, better at apprehending the unfolding of reality, which is like, that's part of maturation. Yes. Yes. So I guess obviously part of wisdom, right? Phronesis, uh, and, and Sophia, but definitely yes. Phronesis is the idea of the experience, basically from exp the intelligibility from experience, right? And that, and that's the thing is like beauty has this connection with time. Very deep connection with time on two grounds. One is from, I'll use from in music theory from Guido, the idea that the last note of a composition retroactively completes the entire harmony and composition of music. Um, so in music theory, exactly like, right. It's so exactly, exactly. Yes. So, yeah. and that's actually very powerful. Actually, that's a very important moral aspect. So the idea that the property of forgiveness, right. Is the power that even though the evil things did occur to you in your life by the act of forgiveness, you retroactively in time transform all the evil that yep. was done before, right? So just to draw out like that, and from Ecclesiastes, right? I think I think in book, I think in section three, he made everything beautiful in its time. He also put it in man's heart, the eternity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? At the same time, so I'm just ripping, I'm thinking of these points right there, um, right? So there's this kind of uh, right that and what you brought up before this idea of time when you when we when we're encountering this apprehension of the beautiful at this exact moment, the beautiful tree, it wreck, it strikes through the significance. And I think uh, the, the quote in line from my good friend, Daniel Gardner from OG Rose, it actively, it reveals to you possibilities that you did not even realize were there. Yep. Right. It strikes through That's into right. you the, an opening of possibility. This is why the language of freedom comes very deeply at holding hands with beauty because beauty strikes through you possibilities that you didn't even think were possible before. That's exactly it. You, you sort of re you do this reconstruction of your past that then that is, that is wedded to the opening up of new futures, new possibilities for you. That's exactly it. The timing aspect. But for me, I mean, this, this is Rusin's, you know, bearing witness to epiphany. There's a musicality to intelligibility itself, like you're just saying here. I mean, any pattern works this way, any pattern and intelligibility is about pattern. All patterns have this musicality to them. And if we think intelligibility is our primary bond with realness, with reality as it's unfolding, 
then there's right that musicality is part is, is disclosing of reality in some profound way too so we tend to think of this as oh well you know there's something uh, you know purely subjective going on no that like you said that last note re or the even the last word of the sentence right exactly no 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 that's something about how reality itself the musicality of 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 intelligibility points to that very f that that nature somehow we well this is for me a neoplatonist there's the, the, there there is simultaneously the procession and the return there is the flow out and the flow back and they're completely interpenetrating each other yes and it's and again i think the idea of like almost this language of homecoming right it's so again i, I brought it up before like it, when the, when this revealing happens yeah. this last note it's almost like you were it was always there from the beginning but you didn't so it's almost like you have a homecoming that, that there's a kind of deep sense the greeks had this where when we come into encounters of the beautiful it's like we came home again right so this is kind of recollectional kind of as you're running through um this is really powerful because it draws that's the thing it, it basically what appears to be kind of like as you said the kind of cr the the kind of flavor of existence gets collapsed into the self right in modern and modern points of view and we think that there's, there's just this dead matter, this dead clockwork existence on the outside reality. Uh, and if we are not seeing it at the moment, it means there's nothing there. That's quite the contrary. It's actually the reverse. It's, at least that'd be my reading of it. It's actually reality by these patterns and these realizations of the beautiful. We reveal that we were, it's, there's over this excessive abundance. So that's the thing from, uh, this is from a public blindness. The, the blindness of the person going out of the cave can come from two reasons, lack of the sun, and over excessive sun, right? Excess, excess the, the loss of light, the deficiency exactly. of it, and the excess of it. So, I mean, what we're saying here, Rilke is running through my head. We've got two lines from Rilke. One is from the archaic bust of uh, Apollo, where he goes through all of this and how it's suffused with beauty. And then he ends with the line, you must change your life, right? Which is such a great, that beauty does that to you. It calls you. But then uh, odd to not be cut off when he talks about the inner, what is it? it intensified sky hurled through with birds and deep with the winds of homecoming right this whole this and so those both right um both of both of that you must change your life but also the homecoming brings me to the last topic i want to talk to you about which is the one near and dear to my heart which is the meaning crisis because this is yes. we're talking about the deep right re apprehension remembering reappreciation of beauty is integral to getting that kind of deep a reality that has a depth that can call to us so we have to change our life but nevertheless gives us a profound sense of homecoming that is so central to meaning in life uh, you know that that sacred is both our, our 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 deepest home and our ultimate horizon at the same time. You know, and the numinous and uh, auto and stuff like. That. And beauty seems to be right in Plato, like the, the 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 gift, as you said, that can tutor us in the way we need to be educated in order to address the meaning crisis. I know that's a very pompous and grandiose thing to say, but I think at the end of our discussion, we can at least frame the question. How, how does that land for you? There, there, there seems to be a thesis here that unless we properly recover in Tolkien's sense of recovery, beauty, we will not be able to awaken from the meaning crisis. Correct. It's our access to get, to get hope, to have hope again. I would agree with that 100% on two grounds. One is yeah. because the good, I mean, a comment, I talked with colleagues about this, right? So What's the difference between art and propaganda? I always talk about this. The propaganda has the good strangling the art object in the first place, meaning like the messaging of what is to be good, what is to be appropriate, what is to be desired, strangles the art. And actually, and then when you look at it retroactively, like kind of later on, it kind of it feels very, it, gets, it's, it feels dated. It feels very like trapped in a very particular time and context. And you feel like the overwhelming of the propaganda message overtaking the artwork so this so what i'm getting at here is the beautiful this is this is my riff on this point the beautiful always has this excess of value it has significance kind of emanating through it i say this because so i come from a training in graphic design like the fact that we can grab commercial objects that are meant like matchbooks packaging from the early 1800s and people can look at it today again we don't use those products 
um, and say, those are beautiful. It's because they don't have utility anymore. Their utility, their use value no longer exists. It doesn't have a utility value, but yet it's still beautiful. It has this kind of, it can overlast kind of um, the loss of meaning in one context. It can be overpowered. It can still remain in beauty and meaning. I say this also because even the example from Aristotle, the natures of, of friendship, right? Friendship of pleasure, friendships of utility, and friendships of virtue. The utility and pleasure come and go. They could, they have that kind of effervescence kind of running away, but virtue kind of withstands and withholds and redeems and kind of holds together. So I think in terms of when we're interpreting this is the idea that by us reconnecting and recovering beauty, as you're saying, this is the path to gain us back access to a world significance. Because the idea is that, you know, generally the argument, why is architect, why is our modern architecture, or modern art, our modern world ugly? Like, why is it not having that sense of meaning? Why do we have this kind of a very minimum symptom relationship between the built world and the meaning crisis. One of the art, one of the claims I would make is to say, because we've cut ourselves off from the beautiful, the beautiful is not considered the object of investigation and pursuit and study in the art world. It's not. So therefore it's not designed for it. It's not optimal. It's not, well, you can't really, that's the point. You can't really optimize for it, but you can the goods. You can, op, you can min max all, all day yep. for utility functions. But beauty, when that becomes out of the equation, again, similar thing, just like acting or contact with one another. If I'm going to, if I have an accident, a car accident with someone, am I conducting myself in a fitting, beautiful manner with them that's just and fair and in virtue? No different than that in our built environments. Are they in beauty? Do they have something more to them than just simply, quite frankly, utility functions? Now, here's an example of how this played out. So in the, mo in, in, in mid central modernism, the kind of, a brutalist kind of optimization of of houses as just living machines, basically machines for living, and that the the downtown was just a mechanism for traffic flow for cars to come in and out and, and optimize modes of how fast can we get cars in and out. These are not beautiful. And then when we did that, we destroyed these places. We've hollowed them out from any kind of actual presence of wanting to be there or actually a kind of soul to it. And actually, uh, Roger Skolton had a lot of discussion about this, that when places are made ugly, we want to just destroy them. We'd have no interest to preserve and care them, which is a very high, that kind of design of care, kind of what do we, what do we want to take care yeah. of? Yeah. Things that we love. And when, be and thus when we have spaces that are not beautiful, we don't want to protect them. We don't want to take care of them. We have no interest to do so. So I just find that. I agree with you that the meaning crisis, at the very minimum, the the, the main main world is, has are symptoms to show that, and the way to get that back is to reconnect with the beautiful because it's not discussed. It is not considered like maybe this way. I say this because I think of Christopher Alexander and his discussion in pattern language, uh, um, in architecture. He talks about the whole pretense. Is that when the architect is working in the tensions and the conflicts that come up of multiple actors coming together to make a built environment, the architect has to hold in mind his first principles, the things that he's working for. No law, no different than a doctor has to hold the health of his patient as his highest principle. That's what he has to care for. Yep. An artist has the architect has to hold beauty, not budget, not. And correspond with all the other demands to be fitting, right? To respond to the conditions of the moment. But he has to hold his first principle at heart and hold steady to it. How many artists, and architects hold that? As a practicing designer, I know that is generally not held up as the standard. Because also we don't have we don't have an arg we don't have the kind of bring back to argumentation. We do not have the arguments and the equipment to justify why beauty is something not of aesthetic preferences or norms, but something of ontological existence that connects to the deepest boundedness of not just our reality in a short-term utility function, but of whole civilization of decades or centuries or millennium. So that's the key thing too. Generally, a good sign of wisdom is your, time, is your time preference window. If your time preference window is a couple of weeks or months, yeah. very different order priority of relationships versus years centuries, millennium, your, your order of priority of action, it'd be very different. I agree. 
Uh, beauty is the at the time scale of wisdom, and wisdom is the time scale you need in order to build people and civilizations. Um, and I think that's a fundamental uh, good point to end on. And Thomas, um, I'm going to give you the last word, as I always do. Uh, I hope that uh, we, you and I talk again. But uh, so first of all, shamelessly uh, promote your course again. I think you've demonstrated very aptly uh, uh, the depth and the profundity of your reading of Plato and your reflections on beauty. I think for those people who are interested in my work, I think you've also demonstrated just amazing convergence and, and, uh, and dialogue between your work and my work. So, I mean, those are two good reasons uh, for people who might be watching this video why they should take your course. Uh, if you wanna add any other reasons, um, uh, uh, please do. But uh, uh, just uh, again, final words, anything you wanna say, we'll talk about your course briefly and then any final words and then we'll wrap it up. I mean, first of all, John, I want to thank you for the chance to talk with you. I mean, it's so fun. So to have someone of, of your interest and love of, of Plato to work, to talk with me, I mean, I very much appreciated our time together. Um, it's a great blessing. I think your work is very important. I've been a big fan of your work for years. So it's a real honor to talk with you. I want to just first thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank you, Hannes, who's leading the Halkion Academy for the opportunity to teach the course, Plato, Beauty and Virtue. I think his work online has been outstanding in reinvigorating the philosophical project on the online space. The course space, again, the, obviously someone watching for this long, I think this is someone who cares about these topics of not just of a kind of reconsideration of the philosophical investigation of Plato in the modern world. That's, that's responding to cognitive science, that responding to the modern world, to the contemporary world. And that that generally that the direction we've ended up, this path, this end point we ended up at historically does not mean it's the end. It's not the terminus. It is simply an opportunity for a pivot. And I think a good way to do that, an excellent method is to return to our foundations, to return to the foundations with a new reading that's possible. And I think from, not I think, I know from discuss, as we discussed this, this last hour plus that there is such a depth of a new possibility of understanding of Plato from seeing a beauty of truth, of goodness, of ethics, of law, that we can come up to a new understanding and we can cultivate a, a new direction by investigating these dialogues together. And it would be a great honor to have you in the course. I think it'd be immense benefit to join that if this is something you've interest in. The course has a pro seminar option. That's, these, are, we, these are five sessions on Saturday, starting on July 27th for two hours. You'll be in a room with me and, and like-minded individuals where we have two prompts where you'll discuss based on the readings of that week. You'll discuss with your colleagues there, come back into the main floor. We'll talk together. We'll do that for, we'll do that for four weeks with the opportunity in the last week to do a piece of writing. Uh, I think, I think writing and philosophy courses are and these kind of classes are incredibly important because it gives you a chance to articulate your thoughts down into a concrete form and chew on the great diversity of ideas and possibilities and richness that's possible. That ideally you should be, ideally, I know this from, I've done courses like this, it should be kind of bubbling, a kind of like uh, en envelopment of the soul kind of lit up to talk, to kind of like express something, kind of articulate it through in writing. Um, you know, we have opportunity to, to share that with the, with the group and I get feedback from myself on that piece of writing. We also have, if you don't, are not available for five, for the five Saturdays, you can also join uh, just get the recordings that are pre-recorded with my lecture notes related to it. Those are available online at the Alcon Academy. And then lastly, if this is just, if you want to have a discourse kind of similar to me and John are having together, again, just riffing on very different topics and you've got a kind of research project or any kind of investigation you want to just kind of riff on one-on-one, -on -one, I do have one-on-one -on -one sessions available. I already have a bunch of people already signed on. There are five slots total available. Two of them are already taken. So I'm very excited to offer the opportunity to your audience if they want to join in. Those are, you, you basically bought, you purchased that, we, we'll schedule time um, during the five weeks to have those one-on-ones. So thank you. Um, I, just to reinforce what Thomas said, I've, I've myself, I've done two courses with Halkian, uh, uh, Beyond Nihilism and Ultimate Reality, God and Beyond. Uh, Johannes is a friend of mine. I, it's a class act, everybody. It's a class act. Halkian Academy is a class act. And it's really, it's, it's, it's philosophia. It's the way we should be doing philosophy if we are concerned about wisdom and meaning. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you so much.